the paper that I, I did together with Arkin Arboneda and Ronina Assis. Um, this was actually prepared for um, initially for the Philippine Commission on Women, but we've extended the study to include more recent information. Um, they say that we, we decided to um, work on this paper because they say that um, 60 is now the new 40. So hindi na yung um, um, don't. In fact, I have some comments on the the um, picture for the for the the poster for this seminar. Uh, hindi na yata yun yung typical na na senior citizen look. Anyway, for this afternoon, um, allow me to share the outline of the presentation. Um, We'll, I'll be um, discussing briefly the situation of senior citizens in the Philippines and then some policies and programs for senior citizens and identify some gaps in these policies and programs and offer some recommendations. Next, please. Um, the motivation for this is that um, we all know that senior citizens are less economically active and they also need greater health services. So what are the policies and programs to provide income support and health services to senior citizens? Are these policies and programs adequate to address the needs of senior citizens? Um, next slide, please. So if we look at the um, projection, about 1.05 billion or 13.5% of the world population in 2020 are aged 60 years or over. And this is projected to increase to 1.41 billion or 16.5% of the total population by 2030. And then to increase further to 3.07 billion or 28.2% by 2100. So we can see that um, the number of um, the elderly or the senior citizens, I will be using those terms um, uh, synonymously, and um, they are expected to grow um, quite fast if you look at the, the chart. Next, please. In Asia, the share of senior citizens to total population is expected to shift from 13.1% in 2020 to 33.7% in 2100. If you're looking for them, the, the color, um, and the circles would indicate the, the region that it is, or the continent that it is representing. So if you're looking for Asia, that's the red um, shaded area in the map, as well as in the red shaded circle, um, or the circle with the red band. And so that shows that the share of senior citizens is going to increase from 13.1% in 2020 to 33.7% in um, 2100. And you can see that the share um, for most of the continents will actually be in over or close to 30%, at least 30%, except for um, Africa, um, where still relatively young population, so that by 2100, the share of senior citizens would still be below 20%. Next, please. Among all countries, the Philippines ranks 117th in terms of percentage share of elderly population at 8.6% in 2020. Um, by 2050, it's expected to go up. The share is expected to go up to 16.5% of the total population. Next, please. But in terms of magnitude, the Philippines ranks 22nd at 9.43 million in 2020 um, and is expected to go up to 23.86 million um, by 2050. Next, please. So if we look at some of the, the vital statistics, you will notice that um, we've made some progress if you look at the total fertility or the number of live births per woman. Um, it has gone down from 4.92 during the period 1980 to 85, down to 2.58 births per woman um, in 2015 to 2020. Um, and then if you look at the under 60 mortality or the deaths under age 60 per 1,000 live births, we can see that um, it has actually gone down from um, the period 
1980 to 1985, it was 204.69 deaths under age 60 per thousand live births, down 257.13 uh, during the period 2015 to 2020. And you will also notice that the um, under 60 mortality rate is much lower for um, for females, okay, did I quote the right numbers earlier? The brown bars represent the numbers for both sexes. The blue bars represent um, the data for males and the pink bars represent the data for um, females. So um, the under 60 mortality rate for both sexes has gone down from 267 to 212 over that period. And for men, um, from 325 to 264, and for women, as I mentioned earlier, it's much lower, from 204 to 257. Um, also, the life expectancy at birth, um, given some, given this progress in, in um, health uh, and reduction in mortality, has actually gone up over time. Over the same period, it has gone up for both sexes from average of 64 years to 71 years um, during the period 2015 to 2020. And women have higher life expectancy at 75 compared to 67 for men. So these have contributed towards having an aging population. Next, please. So let me talk briefly about the situation of senior citizens in, in the Philippines. Next, please. Um, in the Philippines, senior citizens are defined in Republic Act 9994 as any person aged 60 years or over. Um, in, uh, based on the 2015 Census of Population and Housing by the Philippine Statistics Authority, there were about 7.5 million senior citizens, or representing about 7.5% of the total population in 2015. And there were about 3.3 uh, million males and 4.2 million females. Next, please. And in terms of location, the national capital region, Central Luzon and Calabar Zone have the largest shares of senior citizen population. So almost four in every 10 senior citizens reside in NCR, Central Luzon and Calabar Zone. Next, please. So this is, we're just showing the distribution of uh, the population by age groups. And what we can see, you can see from the figures um tumatabayin dun sa taas that means that um the share or the number of senior citizens are actually for the older groups are actually increasing so the shares are actually um, increasing for the older groups so that if you look at the um, for instance if you look at 60 um age group 60 to 64 um if you have about 2.4 uh, million um, males and females, 1.3 million males and 1.4 million females um, in 2015. Uh, by 2045, it's projected that you would have 3.1 million males and 3.3 million females. Next, please. Um, many senior citizens struggle with poverty. So among the estimated senior citizen population in 2015, using the data from um, the Family Income and Expenditure Survey, um, there are actually um, about 890,000 senior citizens who belong to families classified as income poor, and about 300,000 uh, senior citizens belonging to families classified as food poor. Um, when we talk of income poor, we're actually comparing the income per capita income of that family with the poverty threshold, meaning if you're income poor, you don't have enough income to meet basic food and non-food needs. Um, if you're classified as food poor, that means that you don't have enough income to meet basic food needs. Um, and so what we're finding is that the poverty incidence in 2015, based on the PSA data, is about 13.2%, meaning that 13.2% of the senior citizens can be classified as income poor, and 4.3% can be classified as food poor. Um, you will notice if you look at the bar chart, um, this shows actually the um, distribution um, of the um, 
uh, this is actually the the um, yeah the distribution of uh, the seniors um, and you will notice distribution of the population of seniors you will notice that 5.5 percent of the senior citizens are in the poorest decile and 15.5 percent are in the richest decile um, that could actually reflect the fact that those in the richer deciles tend to um, live longer due to better access to health care and better nutrition, among others. Um, also, you will notice that 39.5% of the seniors belong to the bottom five deciles, while 60.5% of the seniors belong to the richest five deciles. So, mas maraming, deci uh, maraming seniors who belong to the richer um, income groups. Next, please. Um, now, using data at tw uh, for 2017, the annual poverty and annual poverty indicator survey, uh, we note that about 5.2 percent of senior citizens are in the bottom income decile. So, hindi masyadong malayo dun sa number that we that we got for 2015 using FIES. Um, and you will notice also that 16.6 percent were in the richest income decile. And again, you will notice that uh, mas mataas yung um, um, males um, dun sa uh, in the richest in the richer income days compared to uh, females. Um, yes. Okay. Next, please. So, what are the senior citizens doing um, using the data from the 2015 census of population? And this is released by, by PSA. Um, the data shows that 42.1% of the senior citizens are gainfully employed. Um, so they are um, workers. And if you look at the occupation uh, that they are engaged in, 37.7% are in um, skilled agricultural, forestry, and fishery workers, while 15.8% uh, are workers engaged in elementary occupations. What about the rest of the senior citizens? 22.3% 22 are pensioners, retired and disabled. 20.8% are housekeepers in own hands and 14.8% are students and dependents. Um, I didn't show you here anymore uh, the full table on educational attainment, but uh, we noted that about 51% um, of senior citizens completed at most elementary education and about a fourth of them um, have at least some high, sc high school um, education. Next, please. Um, when comparing across different age groups, we find that senior citizens are less economically active, um, defined as do not have a job or business, than younger age groups. So, for instance, if you look at the uh, bars, um, the first bar, orange, um, refers to all age groups. And then the next bar represents age group 30 to 39. And then the next bar, um, light green in my uh, computer, um, rep represents the age group 40 to 49. And then um, the next one is 50 to 59. And the last bar, which is dark brown, um, represents the age group 60 and above. You will notice that the bars, the first four bars are close together. Um, and then the one for the age group 60 and above falls down drastically. Um, they, they're, um, the proportion of population have work or business for the 60 and above is much lower than those for the younger age group. So, for instance, if you look at the rightmost uh, side, that's the data for 2017. Um, the proportion of senior citizens who are um, who have a job or or business is only 43.8 percent, as compared to, for instance, the age group 50 to 59 at 76.7 percent. For 40 to 49, that's 78.7. For 30 to 39, that's actually 74.9. So 
you will see that senior citizens are actually um, less economically active. Um, you will also note that over time, um, there seems to be an increase from 2008 to 2014 um, in terms of the um, economic participation of seniors from 47.2 in 2008 to 50.1 in 2014. However, in recent years, from 2014 to 2017, we note that there has been a decline in the proportion of senior citizens who have a job or business. So falling from 50.1% in 2014 to 43.8% in 2017. Next, please. Um, we um, broke it down further, um, those who are 60 and over, into um, different age groups. So we looked at the participation economic participation of 60 to 64, 65 to 69, 70 to 74, 75 and over. And then the last bar would represent all senior citizens. And you will notice that senior citizens tend to be, tend to remain to be economically active until they reach 70. And the higher proportion um, in lower income decile, a higher proportion among the lower income as being economically active. So um, if we were to look at this more closely, what this suggests is that uh, people don't stop working when they reach um, 65, they continue to work. And that proportion is higher among the um, lower income groups. And probably that's a reflection that the poor cannot afford to be unemployed if they don't have um, um, pensions, if um, they don't have other sources of income, then they will, they're forced to work even beyond um, 65. Or um, you could also take it that um, they're economically active because, um, you know, um, as I mentioned earlier, 60 is now the new 40, so um, they can still um, are, can be very productive. And so um, there's no significant, um, um, not as large a drop uh, between the proportion of those of who are economically active between 60 to 64 and 65 to um, 69. And uh, I just want to mention that actually the compulsory retirement is 65 for government and 60 for some private companies. And the law mandating compulsory requirement was actually passed in 1992 when life expectancy was 67.5. Um, now the life expectancy is 71. So. Um, the question is, should we consider revising the uh, retirement age? But I think that's a topic for another webinar. Next, please. Um, across income decides, a significant proportion of economically active senior citizens are self-employed. So um, if you look at that, um, this is the bar. Um, one, two, three, four. Um, what color is this? I don't have a pointer, but um, the first bar, the first, uh, this is stock bar, would be work without pay in own family operated farmer business. The second would be work with pay on own family operated farmer business. The third is employer in own family operated farmer business. And the fourth category would be self-employed without any employee. And you will notice that up to the ninth decile, Majority of those who are economically active are self-employed. But for the richest decile, they tend to be either self-employed or employer in own family operated farm or business. Next, please. Um, between males and females, we find that females are less economically active than males. So for instance, um, among senior citizens, um, that's one, two, towards the, the right hand side, um, the uh, proportion of uh, males who are economically active is 53.9% as compared to 35.6% for um, females. And that pattern is the same across um, all age groups. Um, 60 to 64, 65 to 69, 70 to 74, 75 and over. And even for the younger age group, um, age 15 to 59. And that could probably be um, 
due to the responsibility of women to care for the home, as some studies have shown. So partly due to that. Next, please. Um, we also note that the growing population of senior citizens entails an increasing need for healthcare and related services. So senior citizens often suffer from several health conditions, take various maintenance medications, and or require more interactions with healthcare providers. Although half of older Filipinos consider themselves to be of average health, they have reported functional disabilities and illnesses such as arthritis, rheumatism, high blood pressure, and chronic back pain. That's according to 2007 Philippine study on aging. So because of this, I think um, it's just uh, like a typical machine, uh, you know, after so many years, uh, it needs to be um, maintained. It requires more maintenance than um, a younger machine. Next, please. So uh, that's a brief overview of the situation of uh, senior citizens. Let me now turn to some of the policies and programs that have been implemented by the Philippine government to cater to the needs and um, um, to the needs and um, um, concerns of senior citizens. Next, please. So what I've highlighted is, is basically needs in terms of health, although I did not show that anymore. I just quoted the finding from uh, other studies and then also showed that there's less um, economic participation among um, senior citizens. So basically looking at that. So how do you address um, that uh, those uh, concerns, meaning uh, greater health needs as well as need for income support? So the government social protection programs for senior citizens um, provide income support, such as through retirement packages, pensions, discount privileges, tax incentives, and healthcare support. Um, social protection programs for senior citizens include senior citizen discount and tax incentives, contributory pensions such as from SSS and GSIS, non-contributory pension, um, what we call the social pension program being implemented, and then field health and also other incentives that could be provided by um, even local government units. So if you turn to contributory pension that's being managed by SSS and GSIS, we have for the public sector um, the GSIS program wherein retirees are provided with retirement packages depending on their years of service in the public sector. Now for private sector employees, OFW self-employed, non-working spouses, members separated from employment, you have um, the social security system, um, who provides um, pension or retirement pensions for retirees who are 60 years and above. Now, we also have, in addition to that, the National Health Insurance Program, wherein senior citizens who are not covered by any of the existing membership categories of field health are automatically enrolled in the government's health insurance program. Next, please. So, um, just before I leave that, so in principle, if you have that, all senior citizens are actually covered by PhilHealth. Now let's go to um, the non-contributory uh, pension, um, because what I mentioned earlier, are actually the contributory uh, pension we're in. Contributory means that you have to pay something to be able to um, receive a pension. So while working, you have to pay, if you're a government worker, you have to contribute um, to that pension by paying part of your salary. And then the same thing is uh, true for those working in the private sector. Now, when you say non-contributory pension, that means you don't have to contribute to pay um, something to be able to receive this pension. So Republic Act number 9994 or the Expanded Senior Citizens Act of 2010 was enacted in 2010 was enacted in 2010 to provide for a monthly stipend for indigent senior um, citizens. And this is for uh, the qualifications to be um, eligible for this, or you should be frail or sickly or disabled without regular income or support from family and relatives, and without pension from private or government institutions. So this is being implemented by the Department of Social Welfare and Development and the SOCPEN aims to provide additional government assistance through a monthly stipend of 500 pesos to identified indigent senior citizens. 
um, an additional stipend of 200 pesos per month um, was provided for by the train law under the unconditional cash transfer program of the government. And the monthly additional cash grant has been increased to 300 pesos in 2019 and 2020, but it stops in um, 2020. So by 2021, um, this provision of, for, of the train law um, will no longer provide additional um, cash transfer to the senior citizen. And if you look at the number of beneficiaries across time of the SOC 10 program, you will notice that it has gone up from um, 475,478 in 2014 to 3.3,796,791 uh, in 2019. And consequently, the budget has also increased from 3.1 billion in 2014 to 23 billion in 2019. Um, so I um, won't go through this um, in detail, but um, I think uh, those working in the in the government sector would be very familiar with this. But basically these are just the, this spells out the qualifications to be able to get certain retirement benefits. So basically if you worked in government, for instance, for at least 15 years in service or at least 60, 60 years upon, re, upon retirement, then you get a certain amount of uh, pension. Next, please. Similarly, uh, for those working in the, in the private uh, sector, uh, SSS provides uh, pensions and this, the coverage would be um, for employers, private sector employees, and self-employed persons, and that's for compulsory coverage. And then you also uh, could opt for voluntary coverage for OFWs, non-working spouses, and members separated from uh, employment. And again, retirement benefits depends on the credited years of service of the member. And um, this just spells out the, the details. I won't go into that. The details of all of these are actually in the paper I mentioned at the start of the presentation. Next, please. Um, if you look at the number of um, pensioners, um, you will notice it's increasing over time. The blue bars refer to um, pensioners um, from SSS, and then the green bars would be pensioners um, from GSIS. Um, we all know the numbers are much smaller for government because as you all know, I mean, the number of workers in the government is much smaller than those in the private sector. Um, but I think what is just, uh, what we just need to take note of here is that uh, the number of pensioners increasing or have been increasing since 2005, and you don't expect that same rate of increase for um, GSIS pensioners because of the number of uh, workers. Next, please. Um, I think this one is very interesting. So you see the big gap um, in terms of the number of pensioners, much higher for SSS. But if you look at the average monthly retirement pension, it's substantially higher for GSIS pensioners. So for instance, if you look at, there's no data for 2018 for um, GSIS pension, but um, if you look at the 2017 data, for instance, um, the average monthly retirement pension for SSS is about 5,123. And then for government, it's three times at 18, more than three times, 18,525. That's primarily because of the higher contributions made by GSIS um, members. Um, next, please. Um, the other program is the PhilHealth um, a program, which uh, addresses the healthcare needs. Um, the Republic Act number 10645, enacted in 2014, provide for mandatory PhilHealth coverage for all senior citizens. So I, as I mentioned earlier, technically, all senior citizens are uh, members of PhilHealth in, under one um, program or another of, of PhilHealth. Premium contributions are sourced from the proceeds of the SIN tax law. 
um, but seniors with regular sources of income will continue to pay the premium. And the benefits include fixed case rate for inpatient services in private hospitals. Um, although one would note that um, the case rate would probably be, is probably much lower than the actual cost um, in the private hospital. No balance billing for inpatient services in public hospitals, outpatient benefits enjoyed by PhilHealth members in other membership categories, um, the benefit packages for illnesses. Um, and if you look at the number of cities, senior citizens who are members of PhilHealth, um, it has gone up from 4.46 million in 2014 to 8.8 .8, um, million in 2018, and this does not include yet um, dependents and senior citizens registered under the sponsored members category. This is the data from PhilHealth, um, admin data from PhilHealth. And I just want to um, uh, point out that the estimate of population of senior citizens in 2018 is around 8.685 8,685,698, so lower than the number of members, um, senior citizen members listed in this table. So there might be some double counting of senior citizens in the PhilHealth data since a senior citizen may fall in more than one category. Next, please. Um, in addition to that, senior citizens or minimum wage earners are exempted in paying individual income tax. Uh, Republic Act number 9994 grants to all senior citizens the following incentives and benefits. So, for instance, um, uh, you get 20, I, I get 20% discount plus VAT exemption when I go to restaurants, um, vacation centers, uh, even local airfares, hotel and lodging, um, admission fees to uh, places of culture, and even medical. Uh, related expenses such as um, medicines. Uh, there are also other benefits and incentives like free training fees for socioeconomic programs conducted by private and government agencies, free medical and dental services and diagnostic and laboratory fees, educational assistance, um, priority, okay, like this one, priority in queues, you don't have to, um, you have a separate queue um, and then you get 100,000 cash grant upon reaching the age of 100 years, and other benefits and incentives provided by local government units. Next, please. So, um, so basically, you would have noted that I focused on programs that are intended to provide income support and also to address healthcare needs of the elderly. So now let me turn to um, what are the gaps in these policies, specific policies and programs. Next, please. So if we look at the access to social protection programs, you will note that 5.7 million or about seven in every 10 senior citizens are covered in at least one of the income support programs, SSS, GSIS, social pension, or field health um, based on the data in 2017. Also 2.5 million or every three in every 10 or about three in every 10 senior citizens are covered in field health plus at least one of the income support programs. And we note that 26.8% of the females are covered in, um, they have at least field health plus one of the income support programs. Uh, but this is lower than the coverage for males, which is 34.4%. So again, medyo mas um, lugi yung mga females when it comes to coverage of field health plus at least one of the income support programs. So the bottom chart would show um, the proportion of senior citizen population covered in at least one social protection program. So um, this corresponds to the first number I quoted you that about seven in every 10 are covered in at least one of the one of these programs. And if you look at the coverage for those in the poorest income decile, it's only 56%. So only 56% of those senior citizens belonging to the poorest decile would have one of these um, um, social protection programs as compared to 80% for the richest income decile. So yung mga nandun sa richest decile tend to have greater access to, to 
uh, at least one of these uh, programs. And also, again, we know smaller, lower access for females compared to males. So um, if the access of males is, if 71% if of the males have access to at least one of the social protection program, only 65% of females have access to at least one of these programs. Next, please. Um, and then in terms of access to SSS and GSIS, 27.7% um, or about three in every 10 senior citizens were covered under GSIS or SSS in, in 2017. Um, and as I've mentioned earlier, um, the minimum basic monthly pension for um, GSIS members is 5,000, higher than the, that for SSS at 2,000. Uh, and in terms of, that's the minimum, but if you look at the average basic monthly pension, uh, as I highlighted earlier, for GSIS, it's 18,525, and it's 5,123 for SSS. Now, the proportion of senior citizens with SSS GSIS by income decile um, is shown in, in the chart at the bottom. And you will see that um, those in the lower income groups uh, would have lower um, proportions of senior citizens that are covered by this contributory pension. And um, that could actually um, reflect the fact that uh, most of them are engaged in the poorer, those in the poorer income DESAs tend to engage in the informal sector and may not have uh, been um, participating in this um, contributory pension systems. Um, so, konti lang yung, yung um, GSIS and SSS members um, among those um, in the poorer income groups. Next, please. Um, turning to PhilHealth, we note that um, PhilHealth covered only 51.4% of senior citizens according to the 2017 APIS. So as I mentioned, in principle, all senior citizens are um, supposed to be members because of the different programs that are available to senior citizens. When asked, I, I think some individuals or some senior citizens are not aware that they are members and report that they are not. Um, in 2018, PhilHealth paid about 31 billion to healthcare providers as benefits availed by senior citizens and lifetime members. And by the way, lifetime members are those who have reached 60 and over and have paid um, um, PhilHealth contributions. Um, for um, so many, so many years. And so they don't have to pay premium anymore and lifetime member na sila, but they still get to avail of the benefits. So although majority of field health members in the lowest income deserts enjoy free, free health insurance coverage and paying members, greater effort is needed to realize the universal coverage stipulated in the Universal Health Care Act. Um, as I mentioned, not all are aware or seem to be aware that they are members and also the benefits um, are not enough to cover all of the healthcare needs of um, senior citizens. So if you look at the proportion of senior citizens with field health by income decile, again, we note that um, this is based again on the 2017 um, APIS data. There seems to be a lower proportion among um, those belonging to the poorer income groups. Um, overall, as I said, 51.4 are reported that they're members of uh, field health, and this is higher for males at 54.9% and um, only 48.5% among females. Next, please. Now, um, looking at the social pension, um, there's um, what we find is that one in every five senior citizens were SOC pen beneficiaries in 2017, again, based on the APIS data. Um, but we um, also processed the data and we found that about 12% of the SOC pen recipients were pensioners of SSS, GSIS, or private insurance, com other private insurance companies. 
and 8% were from the richest income decile. So these findings are in contrast with the eligibility requirements of the um, SOCPEN program. So again, this probably um, suggests the need to revisit um, the targeting of this particular um, program, revisit the eligibility um, criteria, how they can be um, more effectively implemented, uh, how the eligibility criteria could be more effectively implemented. Now, looking at the variation between men and women, there seems to be no large variation, the proportion of men and women benefiting from social pension program. If you look at the bottom chart, 21.1% um, of um, uh, the male senior citizens are able to receive social pension and 21.9% of the female senior citizens are able to receive social pension. Um, but what we find is that 28.8% of the beneficiaries of social pension program belong to the bottom 30%. Um, we are expecting a much higher number for this if um, they're supposed to be for the indigent. Um, also, we find that 69% of the bottom 30% do not receive um, social pension. Next, please. So coverage for senior citizens by economic activity. Again, economic activity here is based on um, the APIS question of whether they have a job or business. Um, and what we find here is that um, um, if you look at the first one, SSS, GSIS, um, they would 27.7% of all senior citizens have um, access to SSS or are members of SSS or GSIS. And for those senior citizens who currently have a job or business, 24% um, are members of uh, uh, SSS or GSIS and 30.5% are those are uh, those without job or, or business. And then in terms of field health, 51.4% of all senior citizens have um, access or are field health members. And um, among those with job or business, 56% uh, of them have access to or are members of field health. And 47.7% of those without job or business are covered by field health. Now among social pension uh, beneficiaries, um, 21.5% of all senior citizens are, um, are beneficiaries of social pension and 20.9% um, with job or business. 20.9% uh, of those with job or business are social pension beneficiaries as compared to 22% for those without job or um, business. Um, if you look at the chart, you will notice that um, for field health, it's more evenly distributed because it's not really based on um, economic status. So the participation or proportion of senior citizens by income decile is not as um, as um, uh, different across um, income decils, although still a bit lower for the poorer income decils. If you look at SOCPEN, this is what we would expect, higher proportion. Um, among the poorer income groups, because in fact, we are targeting this to benefit the poorer income groups. And then in the case of SSS, GSIS, you would notice that um, there's higher proportion among the richer income groups because um, those in the richer income groups tend to work more in the formal sector. And that's why you see this higher coverage among the richer income groups. Next, please. So here uh, we just wanted to show, um, to compare um, the distribution of the um, members um, by income decile and what we find for SSS and GSI or GSIS. This is for the contributory pension program. 6% um, of the member um, senior citizens belong to the bottom three income deciles and 67.4% um, belong to the top three income DESA. So, mas marami talaga from the higher income group. So, as I said, probably because they work more in the formal sector. Next, please. And then in terms of uh, membership to field health, we find that 16.1% belong to the bottom three income deciles 
and 44.8% belong to the top three income deciles. Again, uh, favoring more the um, richer income groups. Next. And, but in terms of social pension uh, recipients, 28.8% of the SOC pen beneficiaries belong to the bottom three income deciles and 24.3% um, were in the top three income deciles. We would expect, uh, you know, uh, probably a bit more um, bias towards, we're hoping that it would, the number would be greater than 28.8% for the poorer income groups. Next, please. Just have a few more um, slides. So, um, for the other citizen discount and tax incentives, um, um, households in higher income deciles spend more on goods and services in which senior citizens are entitled to discount and tax exemption privileges. Um, and consequently, the, the richer senior citizens tend to benefit more from discounts and exemptions as they spend more on the goods and services that are entitled to these privileges. So what the table shows you would be the average annual spending on selected goods and services of households with at least one senior citizen member using the data from the 2015 FIES. And these are the categories which have um, which allows for 20% discount and VAT um, exemption. Um, and you will see, for instance, that uh, okay, restaurants and, and hotels, um, those in the first decile, the poorest decile, would spend on the average per year 3,734 on restaurants and hotels as compared to um, if you look at the richest decile, thirty-five thousand two hundred eighty-two point eighty-two, and so what this is saying is that since the rich tend to spend more on these particular categories, then they tend to um, benefit more um, because they, I mean, the poor don't usually eat out a lot uh, as compared to those in the higher income group, so they would tend to benefit more from this senior citizen discount and tax incentive. Next, please. So basically what I've done is just to focus on a few, as I said, uh, that was the intent to focus on those programs that uh, tend to provide income support as well as to provide healthcare services. So um, let me just summarize the findings before I go to a few of uh, recommendations. Um, population of senior citizens is estimated at 9.43 million in 2020, constituting 8.6% of the total population. Senior citizens tend to be less economically active than their younger counterparts. About 44% of seniors have a job or business, while at least 70% of the younger age groups have a job or business. Senior females tend to be less economically active than senior men, 36% versus 54%. About 13% of senior citizens belong to families that are income poor, uh, based on the 2015 data. Moreover, 39.5% belong to the poorest five deciles and 60.5% belong to the five richest deciles. As I mentioned, this is primarily due to the better health and nutrition um, um, being um, experienced by those belonging to the higher income groups. Next. And the, uh, nevertheless, the elderly need greater health services, as has been documented in many other studies. Um, only 27.7% of seniors are SSS or GSIS members, higher for men, a 32.7% and 23.6% for women. There's low membership among the poorer elderly due to the nature of their work. There's also low membership among workers, um, sorry, um, low membership among workers in the um, private. There's not 100, per, I guess, um, less um, Compliance um, in government, it's easier to implement uh, membership in GI GSIS, but in the private sector, it's more difficult to require everyone to enroll their employees in SSS. Um, only 8% of the elderly in the poorest three deciles are SSS GSIS members, while 44% of the richest three deciles are members. Um, average monthly pension from GSIS is more than three times that of SSS, as I said, mainly because of the higher contributions. A social pension of 500 per month represents 20% of the poverty threshold in 2018 and 30% of the food threshold. So it's not enough really to cover all the food, the basic food and non-food needs of 
um, an individual. Next, please. As of end 2019, 3.8 million seniors are social pension beneficiaries. This represents 40% of all seniors. With a poverty incidence of 13%, this represents significant leakages to the non-poor elderly. If we wanted to provide assistance only to the poor, we would only need 7.4 billion pesos instead of 22.8 billion pesos to provide monthly pension of 500 pesos. That means that if you have this fixed amount, you could actually provide bigger um, monthly subsidy to fewer um, beneficiaries. There's also significant exclusion. Only about a third of the poor seniors receive social pension based on 2017 APIS data. Uh, while all seniors are supposed to be PhilHealth members, not all are aware that they are. There are limited benefits, so there's still considerable out-of-pocket expenses for hospitals and outpatient services. Um, richer senior citizens tend to benefit more from senior discount for selected goods and services since they spend more on these items. Next. So what are some of our recommendations? One is um, we want to promote, particip we recommend part promoting participation of women in social security systems. Since contributory pension programs of the government are only accessible for those previously employed, being employed may improve women's access to social protection programs when they reach the age of 60. Likewise, a non-working woman who's managing the household and family affairs full-time and, and whose spouse is employed and actively pays SSS contributions may avail of a voluntary coverage under the SSS. Second is to increase awareness uh, of senior citizens of the government's social protection programs. Focus must be given to poor senior citizens and those in disadvantaged sectors to identify and address any access issues to these programs. Third is improve the targeting system for social pension for indigent senior citizens. Um, given the government's limited budget, the high leakage rate, um, meaning inclusion of beneficiaries that are already receiving other forms of pension and those belonging to the richest income ladder serves as a barrier to indigent senior citizens not enrolled in the, in the program. Having a comprehensive database of senior citizens and a better targeting system may improve access of indigent seniors. Next, please. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the 500 monthly stipend may not be adequate to sustain the daily needs of indigent senior citizens, particularly if given only every six months. I, I think the um, frequency of release is also very important. So probably the government can revisit the amount and the frequency of payouts of the social pension program. Higher stipend may be possible with improved targeting. And fifth, um, we want to recommend um, data sharing and interoperability of databases of different agencies. For targeted interventions, data is crucial. To identify eligible beneficiaries, data coming from different sources may be needed to validate administrative data. For instance, data of SSS, GSIS, and Listahanan, and um, the newly institutionalized CBMS are needed to validate list of senior citizens that should be given social pension. So here, I think with the um, nationwide implementation of the national ID, uh, that would make it easier to link or merge many of these different um, databases. That's all. Thank you.